According to the New York Post, one Japanese woman used Tinder to meet this man. Soon after, her head ended up as a souvenir in his briefcase. You're watching Darkness Prevails, the best channel to share your creepy stories with the world, because this world is a strange one. Life is lonely sometimes. Thankfully, dating apps like Tinder let you meet and match with people who you might be compatible with, if their profile is real and not just a front to bait you into coming somewhere alone. These are some allegedly true scary Tinder stories that showcase some of the real dangers that come with using a dating app. If you want to appear in a future video I'm looking for scary Starbucks stories, you can send them to me using the links in the description or check out morbidmonsters.com to buy some Darkness Prevails coffee mugs, stickers, decals for your car and t-shirts. And don't forget to stick around for the end of the video when I read my favorite early comments from the previous video. Now then, scoot closer to me, dear. Let me get tender with you. Number one, my friend's life was ruined. Submitted by Evan Says. My friend was an avid user of dating apps, specifically Tinder and I saw it ruin his life in a very terrifying way firsthand. Let's call him Eric for this story. Eric slept around with as many girls as he could using dating apps. He wasn't a jerk about it though, so don't take it that way. He didn't spend the night with anyone who didn't know ahead of time what he was doing, always being upfront about it being physical only. At least, that's what he told me. Well, Eric will never be the same, and it's partially because of that lifestyle, but mostly because there are some very awful people who exist in this world. One day, seemingly like every other day, Eric was messaging different girls on Tinder. Now, I need to let you know that Eric and I lived together in our dorm, sharing the same room. It was an evening after our classes, and he seemed to be all smiles that day, telling me he met someone on Tinder who apparently had a female friend who was up for some group stuff, if you catch my drift. I'd never seen him so excited. That weekend around 7 p.m., Eric left to meet these two girls at a local bar. Now usually, he would text me to let me know how it went once he was on his way home, or to at least tell me he'd be out much later. So when it was two in the morning and I hadn't heard a single word from him, I figured that dog had spent the night at one of their places. It was nearly bedtime for me as well. I drank a few beers and played a few rounds of PUBG. I went outside for a quick smoke, and when I exited the dorms, I nearly tripped over him. Eric was sitting on the front steps. What the heck, dude? How long have you been out here? I laughed. He didn't answer. I sat down next to him and was startled to see his eye was black and he was crying. I'd never seen him cry. Eric, man, are you okay? What happened to you? Well, Eric still wouldn't talk to me. After that night, Eric went back home to his parents' place for the semester, never saying anything more than he just needed a break. To be honest, I was quite worried about him. I'd never seen him so devastated and I wanted to know what in the world happened that night. Everyone who knew Eric wanted to know. It wasn't until he came back the next semester that he broke down and admitted everything to me. Believe it or not, he looked even worse when he returned. When he unpacked that night in our room, I couldn't stop myself from asking questions. I was his best friend and he was mine. I needed to know what was going on. It was eating me up inside. Well, he sat me down and he began to tell me, and to be frank with you, I wasn't ready. Not like I thought I was. When he had gone that night to meet those two girls, he went to the bar where they said they'd be. In the terrible lighting of a near rave, someone grabbed him and pulled him into the bathroom. They were wearing a dress, and he figured it was one of the girls from Tinder. Well, when he entered the bathroom, Another man shoved him into the wall and punched him, 
knocking him out. When he woke up, his wallet was gone and his clothes were out of order. He was also bleeding a bit and, well to put it clearly, his butt was hurting. Eric was too embarrassed and upset to say anything to anyone and he decided he needed to go home. He needed time to deal with what had happened to him. Well, Eric got tested, like he did every year, and that's when what was left of him was destroyed. Eric had contracted HIV. Please, let this be a lesson to everyone. Be careful. You can be loose all you want, but use protection and certainly don't go out every night with a stranger you've never met in person before. There are people out there that prey on others. I know and see what it did to my best friend every day, and I wouldn't even wish that on my enemies. Number two, The Tinder Follower, submitted by Snucky. As a lonely yet awkward person, I found myself in my early 30s without ever having been in a serious relationship. I had my boyfriends and such, but nothing had lasted longer than a month. They weren't bad guys, of course. We just weren't compatible. But times had changed quickly, and I had decided to use online dating apps and websites to see if I could find someone more my taste. I tried OkCupid okay and eHarmony, and a dozen other online dating websites with no real luck. The few guys that did message me or match with me were strange to say the least. Their profiles were suspicious, as were the way they talked. They seemed more obsessive than healthy, so I stayed away. Then I began to look on the app store, and one of the first results was Tinder, an application I'd heard plenty of. It had invented the whole swipe right phrase. I sat down after work that evening and purchased the Tinder Gold membership, then began to swipe. Nine lefts for every right, it seemed, but there were still so many promising guys out there, and of course there were plenty of joke accounts. After I wore out my wrist, I placed my phone on the side table next to me and marathoned some Fortnite live streams through the Roku app on my TV. About an hour later, I got a notification on my phone. I had some matches. Three different guys had already swiped right on me, and I immediately felt excited. Nothing else had worked so quickly or as well. I scrolled through these matches and decided to message my favorite at a glance, who happened to be a 22-year-old guy named Connor. Connor was six foot one, half Cuban, and a very handsome guy. He was also majoring in pre-law, which sounded pretty great to me. I messaged him, deciding to be brave, saying, Hi, Connor, it's nice to meet you. As you can see, I'm a bit rusty. He responded within 10 minutes, saying, Hey there, I was just about to send a message your way. My heart beat a little faster. I hadn't felt this giddy over a guy in four or five years. We started to chat, and by the end of the evening, I figured I'd give him my phone number. Connor was such an interesting guy, he wanted to make a name for himself in the world. He came from a struggling family and worked two jobs to support his mother and pay his way through college. Well, after a week of getting to know Connor, we decided to finally meet at a small concert at the park happening that weekend, when he somehow miraculously had a day off. When the night came, I primped and made sure I looked my best, grabbed some pepper spray because you never know, then made my way to the park. When I arrived, I found a spot in the back as a small crowd gathered into the chairs up front, hoping that would leave enough time for Connor to sit next to me. After waiting for a half an hour, the concert began and Connor was nowhere to be seen. I'll be honest, I was extremely saddened by this he had stood me up. I'd gotten my hopes up only to be hurt after taking a risk after so many years. I left after trying to enjoy another 10 minutes of the concert, but failing miserably. I decided to walk home as my house was only about a mile and a half away, and I didn't feel like being cramped into a bus or hailing a stranger's taxi. 
It was 15 or so minutes into my walk when I realized there was someone behind me. They were wearing a dark colored hood and they were maybe 20 yards away, never getting closer, but never getting further away either. I kept my hand on my pepper spray just in case and continued walking. It was probably just someone else trying to get home, I thought. I turned another three corners and walked across a couple of streets. When I checked behind me again, the guy was still there, still 20 yards away. With a few more lights in the area, I could see him a bit better. It was definitely a man around six feet tall, and he was as thick at the top as he was in his midsection. I could also see a thick beard coming down from his hood. My heart started to palpitate. Why was he still there? He couldn't have been following me, could he? And seeing the shape of his body, I knew it couldn't be Connor. My palms began to sweat, but I cooled down a bit and figured I needed to head somewhere where there would be people. My house would just be too far away if this guy really was planning something. I had turned away from him, analyzing the situation, but not paying enough attention to it. And in that moment of losing myself, I felt a cold and sticky hand stretch over my mouth from behind me, and I screamed. Whoever it was, they had quickly placed their arm around my neck hard, and I could feel veins in my face bursting. But still, I screamed. I kicked and I prayed. And then, we were both knocked hard to the ground, and all the air left my lungs at the same time a sharp sting erupted in my ribs. There was another person there, and besides that, all I knew was that the arm and hand were still around me. I passed out. The next thing I remember is waking up in an open ambulance with a huge bruise on my side. I'd broken a rib, but I was safe. Within that same hour, I learned that the man who was following me had been arrested, that another man, a father walking his daughter home, had attacked him when he saw that I was being assaulted, and I also learned who my attacker was. His name was Carl, and he had been catfishing people with multiple made-up accounts on various dating apps in order to stalk and steal from them. If he wanted to take my stuff, why was he trying to hurt me or even take me? He could have just taken my purse, Something tells me that he wanted more, and I happened to be that victim that he chose to step up his game on. I actually did start using Tinder again, but not for several months afterwards. I choose to believe he was just one evil guy out of plenty of good out there, but there will always be another Carl. Number three. My Tinder Stalker, submitted by Adriana M. This happened a few years ago, when I was about 16 years old. To help you get an idea of me, I'm pretty short, with bright green eyes and long, dark brown hair. I'm not usually very self-absorbed, but from my point of view, with some confidence, I'd like to say that I'm attractive. I'd been on summer break for a while at that point, and being that age, I felt like doing something rebellious, so I snuck out one night. I quietly walked through the small patch of trees lining the back of my house, which brought me into the neighboring streets where my friend's house was located. We sat in her backyard and drank some beer, because we were cool kids like that, I guess. Being a bit intoxicated, we somehow stumbled across the topic of Tinder, which, for those of you who don't know, it's a dating app. We thought it would be fun to screw around on the app. My friend didn't want to make an account, so I decided that I would. I quickly downloaded Tinder and set up my profile. I was a little tipsy by then, but not so much that I didn't understand what I was doing, and I knew for a fact that I was only doing this for the giggles, that's all. As we did our thing on Tinder, matched up and whatnot, my notifications started going off like absolute mayhem. I set my half-empty beer bottle down and looked at my friend. Let's call her Kay. I knew it was a dating website, but I never actually wanted to get into a relationship. 
I shrugged it off and turned my phone off, and then I told myself that once I got home, I could just delete my account and the whole app in its entirety. Not that big of a deal, right? Well, I was wrong. I remember looking at the time. It was nearing 4 a.m., and I felt my body sober up. I had to babysit some kids tomorrow, and I sure as heck didn't want to show up hungover and trashed. I told Kay that I had to go home, and said that I'd let her know if anything noteworthy would happen on Tinder whilst being away. We hugged and I made my way through the patch of trees again, and quietly through the back door of my home. Fast forward to about two days later, I was babysitting again, the same kids that I'd been looking after for a little over a year now. We were just hanging out in the living room. I had a movie turned on for the youngest one. Her name was Sadie. She was only five at the time, and basically a ball of sunshine and cuteness. There was Jacob as well, who was 10 years old, and then Ashton, who was 14, which was why it was weird they wanted a babysitter if Ashton was only two years younger than me. I've got no clue but I didn't mind. I loved the kids and they were a joy to be around. Sadie was quickly fast asleep on the couch. I remember having to pull out her sippy cup strategically from her mouth without waking her up. Jacob and Ashton were both sitting at the island in the kitchen and Jacob was bugging him about something. I wasn't paying close attention to what he was bugging him about though. As I made my way to the island, my phone began to buzz. It was a notification from Tinder. I was weirded out because I hadn't gotten many notifications since two days ago when I downloaded it. I clicked open and I accepted them. Their profile seemed a little catfishy, but I was only in it for the kicks and I thought maybe I could screw around with this guy. Kay would find it hilarious nonetheless. Right away, he messaged me. All I knew about the guy was that his name was Braxton or at least that's what his name on Tinder was. The first message he replied with said this, it would be so exciting to feel your pulse escape as I grabbed your neck. I had to reread this message over and over because I didn't think I was reading it right the first time, but I was. My heart froze. I couldn't think of anyone who would want to send something like that, something so morbid. I looked up to see Ashton and Jacob looking at me with a concerned look on their faces. They asked me if I was okay and that I had inhaled sharply all of a sudden and my face went red. I told them everything was fine and that I had just gotten a sudden migraine. Is that your family? Another message appeared on Tinder. I stared at my phone, no words, no thoughts, nothing. He then sent another message. You're all beautiful, you're mine now. I began to royally freak. I asked him who he was, what he wanted, and to stay away from me and the kids. I blocked him and reported him thereafter. It's been a while since and I've not experienced another encounter. I've chalked it up to an internet troll, maybe. I can't be sure, but that is one story I will never forget, and telling myself it was just a troll helps me sleep at night. Number four, Wheelchair Dad. Submitted by I'm Zapan. I've met a number of girls on Tinder over the years. Nothing was ever serious except for my ex-girlfriend, Tracy. We had dated for a couple of months, but I found out she was married and had three kids. I had no idea she was lying to me, and obviously neither did her husband. I ended it after I found out, but the guilt was all the same. After a long break, I got back on the wagon and I began chatting with another girl I found on Tinder named Sarah. She was cute, down to earth, funny, and according to her social media, she wasn't married. We'd been chatting for about a month, but I'd yet to meet up with her until about a week ago, when my friends invited me to a bar in Palm Springs for my friend's 30th birthday. This city is about two hours from my home, but since I haven't seen those friends for a while, 
and we were celebrating quite the milestone for a friend. I agreed. I checked it out online and saw that the bar had a live band and a dance floor. It seemed like a perfect place to meet and mingle with Sarah. The funny thing is, Palm Springs was only 30 minutes away from her home. I invited her and she didn't hesitate to say yes. She wondered why it even took me so long, but after my last Tinder date, I can't be too careful. The night came and I show up at around 9 p.m. My friends are there waiting for me already and Sarah had agreed to meet me there at 11. I ate, danced, had a few drinks. At 11 p.m. exactly, I receive a text from Sarah telling me she's arrived. I went to the front of the bar and stood there waiting for her. Coming through the door, I see her, pushing an old man in a wheelchair. My stomach sinks. The man is quiet, serious, and looks sickly. When she sees me, she gives me a big hug and says, I hope you don't mind me bringing my dad. He's sick. It was surprising to me as she's never mentioned this before. In fact, she said her dad had just returned from a trip to Haiti and was going to dinner with him last week. I smiled politely and told her not to worry about it. I introduced her and her father to the birthday boy and gave him the don't stare face. He also smiled and greeted my new guests. After a couple of hours of drinks and dancing, I said farewell to Sarah and her father. They went home by van. For the two hours they were there, her father didn't say a word to me and didn't even crack a smile or smirk. He would just stare blankly at whomever was speaking to him. Once they left, I texted Sarah. I hope you had a great time. Sorry about your dad. I hope he gets better. Sucks that I couldn't interact with him much. She didn't reply for about an hour and then only said, thanks. Being the prideful person I am, I did not reply to her text. She either didn't like me in person or she was taking care of her dad. Those were my only two thoughts. At around 3 a.m., we decided to head out and have a few drinks at my friend's sister's house. She lived about five minutes away, so it was the best option, especially since the other option was a possible DUI. When we arrived at the house, we sat in the living room to have a few drinks and listen to music. The curtains were open with a view of the street. As we were talking, my friend Jimmy suddenly yelled, Bro, isn't that your date's dad, the wheelchair guy? I looked up and yes, it was. I felt a cold chill down my spine. How, what could he possibly be doing rolling down the street by himself? I thought to text Sarah, but I decided against it for some reason. At around 6 a.m., we decided to get some rest there in the living room and hit the IHOP early in the morning. At around seven, I woke up freshened up a bit and walked down the street to get in my car. The boys were doing the same. When I got in my vehicle, I started driving to the IHOP down the road. I was about a block down when again I see Sarah's dad sitting still in his wheelchair next to a tree on the sidewalk. I immediately called Sarah and got no response. Now I was beginning to worry. I turned the car around and planned to speak with the man. Maybe he needed help, but when I looked back, he was gone. I was perplexed to say the least, but I decided to go about my day. Kind of missing Sarah during breakfast, I decided to go through her Facebook. Maybe she mentioned something last night, or maybe I have a message from her. After seeing she didn't post about our date, and I started looking through her pictures, which might sound stalkerish, but man, she was beautiful. I felt the same chill down my spine I'd felt before. There was a picture of her and her mother at dinner with her father after his trip. It was not the same man in the wheelchair. And her father looked healthy, fat, and at least 20 years younger than the man in that wheelchair. I was in complete disbelief. Why would she lie to me? Ding, I get a message from her. It was four words that will haunt me forever. Daddy didn't like you. She blocked me, and I haven't heard from her since. Number five. 
Tinder Robbery, submitted by Shower Songs. I was 22 and just starting out on my own in the real world. I got my first apartment, a car, a job, and I didn't have any more school to worry about or parents to bother me. However, the one thing missing still was a girlfriend, the serious relationship that I'd always wanted, and I figured it was time to try for one. I downloaded Tinder, and for a few days on my spare time, I would swipe through various girls in my area. I did have a few matches, but none were all that chatty. But one day, I saw this girl that I immediately thought couldn't be real. I had never been so attracted to anyone. I liked her and immediately matched with her. I wasn't even convinced she was real, but for two days, we spent all our free time chatting and I asked if she wanted to go on a date with me. I was nervous, expecting to be rejected or told that it was too soon. But she replied with this, why don't you just come over, winky face. My eyes lit up and I immediately replied, giving her my address and asking if she wanted to come over instead. She said tomorrow, 9 p.m. I was insanely excited to finally meet her and I couldn't sleep that night. Before 9 p.m. the next day, I prepared the nicest meal I knew how to make and the time finally came when I heard the knock at the door. I went to see if it was her and my heart skipped a beat to see it was her and she was just as beautiful in person. I opened the door and greeted her. I was so distracted by her beautiful smile that I didn't even notice the large man behind her. And by the time I did, he had already had his revolver out and had pistol whipped me in the back of the head. When I came to, I wanted to call the police but I saw that all of my electronics and valuables were gone, including my phone. So I went to a neighbor's apartment and called the cops, but still she hasn't been found, no suspects apprehended. I guess I could say no matter how good they look, I'll always take them on a couple of dates somewhere else before you let them know where you live. Number six. Going on an adventure, submitted by Irene. I've always met guys on Tinder and never have gotten hurt or killed in any type of way. I was always brave and believed people were trustworthy and most of the Tinder guys I hopped in a car with were normal and not even close to being crazy. I guess I just got lucky or so I thought. The guy was matched with me on Tinder for a while, and I was still dying inside trying to desperately somehow replace my feelings and to get over my ex by seeing a new guy. The guy who I matched with was named Ryan and seemed extremely normal whenever I FaceTimed with him. I started to really like Ryan and I really was excited to meet him because he seemed like a sweet guy who seemed like a gentleman who wouldn't hurt me the way my ex did. One night, I was especially fed up with still thinking about my ex, and I FaceTimed with Ryan once more. Ryan kept saying, let's go on an adventure. He wanted to take me to his office to watch a movie. It was almost midnight, and I just decided to give the guy a chance and see him. When he arrived at the college, my friend approved and said he was extremely nice and quite attractive. I hopped in the car with them, and things were fine. Nothing wrong, nothing psychotic, nothing crazy, just fine. We got to his office, and what scared me the most was he apparently forgot his keys. So he pulls out a pocket knife and says he knew a trick. The guy literally opened the door with a pocket knife without setting off any alarms. This office had no security, but it was fancy and looked highly taken care of. I played it cool, giving him the benefit of the doubt, and I tried to convince myself that maybe he actually did forget his keys. But deep down, a part of me really felt that this building was not his office. 
We watched a movie and cuddled together on the couch. Things seemed okay then, and I was guessing the place was actually probably his office by then, since he knew his way around. But the fact that he had to open the door with a pocket knife, it still cringed me. It was fate for things to get worse from there. We started getting intimate, and this guy was literally moaning and breathing abnormally, and he sounded like a psycho. It wasn't some sexy man moan, it was like disturbing grunts, and I just had a bad vibe all of a sudden. Like he sounded like he was from Fifty Shades of Grey or something. After we were finished, and I'm dead serious, it's dark in the room and all of a sudden he... Flash, flash, flash. I see three flashes at my body as I'm laying down naked. He had taken pictures of me without my permission. I told him right away to delete them, but he wouldn't let me look at his phone for a good couple of seconds. Finally, frustrated, he deleted them, but I knew he had sent them to someone. I wasn't stupid. I felt ashamed and told him it was wrong, but he said it was just a friendly joke. A friendly joke. I knew then that once Ryan told me that, my heart sank because he was insane. But at the moment, I thought I was overreacting. I stupidly gave him another chance and sat next to him. Then he got on top of me. He said he was just texting his sister real quick, but I see his phone over my body and flash. He did it again. Then he supposedly deleted the pictures before I could see his phone but I knew he was sending them to someone. After that, I got dressed, and he decided he wanted to take me back to my dorm. I got back, kissed him goodbye, and hoped to never see him again. I blocked him on everything. I literally thought the time a Tinder guy took me to the woods by surprise for a hike at night was creepy, but this experience I had was something else. Now I get stomach pain thinking that my pictures are out there without my permission floating around the internet and these guys' circles. I don't think this is something I'll get over for a long, long time. Number seven, be careful who you trust. Submitted by Corpin J. A while ago, I became very bored and I was recently single so my roommate suggested to me to use Tinder. We started messing around on it, joking with people we matched with and just annoying the boys that were on there for nothing more than hookups. We never had the intention of meeting anyone from the app. Sadly for us, circumstances arose that we both had to move to different cities. Still, I continue to swipe through Tinder in my new place. It's a lot more populated here, and not knowing many people, I decided to maybe meet a few of these people in person. But it was one horrible Tinder date after another. Finally, I started talking to a seemingly very nice and genuine guy. He was eight years older than me, but that didn't bother me. He was part native, with perfectly tanned skin that wonderfully contrasted my very pale complexion. He was a few inches shorter than me, but very muscular, with short brown hair, dark brown eyes that looked almost black and a sweet, somewhat cocky smile. We talked almost every night for a week. I learned we had a lot of things in common, even the weird interests I had that most others wanted nothing to do with. I felt I could be my complete and honest self with him. It was a great feeling. Let's call this guy Omer. I finally agreed to meet up with Omer one evening. He would pick me up and we would go to a Tim Hortons nearby, a coffee shop here in Canada. I don't drive, so he had to come get me. Doing so meant I had to give him my address. The time of our meetup came and Omer pulled up. He was in a company car, making him very easy to spot. As I walked up to the car, I was very relieved to see he was the guy from the photos and even more handsome in person. We chatted as we drove to the Tim's. We sat there drinking our hot drinks till the shop closed at midnight. I learned a lot about him over those hours. He had been married and had a boy with her, then found out she had been unfaithful, which led to him ending it. I felt bad for him. That had happened only a few months prior to meeting him. He told me about his colorful past, 
but that he was turning his life around, and that should have been my first red flag. But I'm an open-minded person, and I don't hold people's pasts against them if they're bettering their future. That past of his included jail time. He made it sound so nonchalant that I assumed it was a stupid reason, such as starting a fight or marijuana possession, mild things to get arrested for and get jail time here in Canada. Once the shop had closed, he drove me home. I told him I had a great time, and had texted me when he got home so I would know he was safe, as he lived in a neighboring town not very far away. I got ready for bed, and as I was getting under the covers, I got a text. Omer asked to see me again. The two of us went on a few more dates over a couple of weeks, usually after he worked, as it was easier than going home than driving all the way back. So I usually saw him in his work uniform. One of these dates was canceled due to him being pulled over by the cops. When I asked why, he explained that he drove without a license because of parking tickets racking up and obviously not being able to pay them while incarcerated, and that his ex must have called and tipped off the police at the nearby station. He said he was sorry, but he couldn't pick me up or come to our date. This was another flag that I ignored. After a few more dates, he asked me if I would come to his place and sleep over on the weekend. By then, I felt comfortable with Omer, and I trusted him, so I accepted and I was actually very excited. He picked me up in his company car as per usual, even though he lacked the license to legally drive it. On the drive to his place, Omer turns to me and explains that he's a recovering addict. This didn't bother me though, because he was bettering himself. He goes on to tell me he's in a recovery house right now. This did give me pause for a moment, but I told him that was fine but again, it was another red flag. As we pull up to the place, he says we have to be quiet as we go in, because I'm not technically allowed to be there. I thought that was weird, but I complied. We go into what was his designated room. There was a bed, a chair, a side table, and a dresser. It was a bit of a mess, but at the same time, it looked so empty. I sat on his bed and he tells me he has to take his car to his boss's place and get a ride back from his boss. Confused, I say okay and go on to my phone while he does so. He told me not to open the door if anyone knocks, then he locks it as he leaves. Immediately, I feel uncomfortable and I push the feeling aside, ignoring yet another red flag. When he returned a little while later, he pulled out a bottle of Jack he placed a finger on his lips and told me he wasn't allowed to have alcohol in the recovery house, but he still drank often anyway. I am not a huge drinker, but I didn't want to ruin his fun. We ordered pizza and watched Supernatural on Netflix. He continued to drink, not too much, but he definitely had a buzz going on. After a while, we got more comfortable, removing a layer or two of clothing. As he stood there in his boxers, something caught my eye. I glanced over, seeing a crudely done swastika tattoo on his thigh. I had to do a double take, and I stared at it wide-eyed. Omer noticed and sheepishly explained that when he was young, he was a skinhead, and he had gotten that tattoo and an SS tattoo on his left bicep. Pointing at them both, he told me that they were done while he was in jail. I was a little shocked, but again accepted it and snuggled up to him in bed. Things got a little sweat-inducing that night. The next day, we watched some more Netflix, and he played guitar for me. That evening, he had to get a friend to pick me up and take me home, seeing he didn't have the company car at the time. As his friend was getting closer to the place, I was getting a very bad feeling causing me to start having a panic attack. I tried to tell Omer that I wasn't comfortable with riding with that friend. He told me, annoyed, that his friend was almost there, and it wasn't nice to waste his time like that. A little more calmly, he told me he'd go with me. As we walked to the friend's car and I saw the friend, the bad feeling got worse. The guy looked like he just walked off East Hastings, a very bad area in a nearby city that had the worst reputation and involved lots of drugs and death. His teeth were terrifying, 
and his face was covered in sores and scabs and had just an all-around bad vibe about the guy. I looked back at Omer, and he ushered me into the back seat. I got in, terrified, and Omer pushed the seat back to sit in the front. I must have been visually uncomfortable because Omer reached his hand back down between the seat and the door, and he held my hand through the whole ride. I had a depth grip on it the whole time. His friend drove like a wild man, driving way too fast and swerving too much for my liking. I was honestly scared we would get into an accident. I began to quietly cry and his friend laughed, asking if he was that scary. I shook my head no, but inside I was screaming. They dropped me off and Omer walked me to the door. He apologized and looked down at me sadly. I then went inside, curled up in my bed and cried. Omer texted me and apologized again, then told me goodnight. I didn't hear from him for a day or two. I texted him worried and finally got a reply from him, explaining that his friend had pissed him off that night and apologized again. We talked a few more days after that when he dropped again. I was starting to get really worried, even more so with the knowledge that he was a recovering addict. I called him over and over, admittedly probably a few too many times, and I tried texting him as well. As I was waiting and hoping for a reply, I decided with no real reason to look up his name in the public records to see what he really was arrested for, something I should have done a long time ago. I scrolled through the long list that included all the parking and speeding tickets he had mentioned. When I was almost to the bottom of the second page, one of the infractions caught my eye. Aggravated assault. This shocked me but my access to the file was limited, so I couldn't see the details past where, when, and if it ended in jail time. I wanted to know more, so I looked up his first and last name and city in Google. An article from 10 years prior came up with his name in it. I clicked on the link and read the article. It said Omer and three others had been arrested for fatally stabbing a man, and it was thought to be gang-related. They broke into his home at night, and attacked him, stabbing him dozens of times. The man was sent to the hospital in bad condition, but pulled through just fine. Omer was charged with attempted murder, but had his sentence lowered for ratting out the other three guys, so he just had aggravated assault, which got him significantly less jail time. Total, he had been in jail for over five years. This was much worse than he had made it sound, and I was freaking out. I texted him and told him to never contact me again and that he better not show up at my place. I blocked him on every social media account I had and I blocked his number from my phone. This whole time I had kept in contact with my friend from before and was keeping her up to date. I had updated her on the situation a few days later. Obviously I was upset and whining to her. She asked if she could do anything to help and I sarcastically told her I would feel so much better if she called him and just told him off. She replied, asking for his name and his number. She rarely knows people's actual names, but instead nicknames for everyone. I laughed, asking if she was serious, and she was. So I sent her his name and number, laughing to myself. A few minutes later, she texted me telling me that she'd called, and when he answered, she had asked him if he was Omer. He said yes, and she continued to tell him something along the lines of him being a piece of crap and to grow a pair or something like that. We laughed, and I told her she was the best. We continued talking over text, and about a half an hour later, the doorbell rang. I was in the basement, so it took me a minute to walk up the stairs. I wasn't expecting anyone or any packages, so I was cautious. Suddenly, there was a loud, hard knock, which made me jump. I quickly called my dad, and he told me to stay calm and stay clear of the windows. I went up to the second floor and peeked through the curtains. Out of the window, I could see a figure I couldn't identify looming by the door. Suddenly, there came a pounding knock from downstairs. It sounded angry, and my heart began to beat faster. I hid under the window. This continued for about 20 minutes, 
then abruptly stopped. When my phone vibrated, I jumped. It was my dad. He calmly explained that he had called a family friend. The friend lived a few doors down who happened to be a police officer, and my dad told me that the officer would go outside and check it out. Being in a townhouse complex, the houses are very close together, making this easier. My dad stopped by later to check up on me. He told me that the officer had gone and just stood at the front step in his uniform, and that whoever had been at the door saw him and left in their car. After that, nothing happened. I deleted my Tinder account and uninstalled the app. I've become very distrusting of new people. I've started doing background checks on almost every new person I meet. This experience has made my anxiety skyrocket, and honestly, I don't leave my house as often, almost never now. Remember, you don't know who you're really meeting online. Always be careful if you meet with strangers. You never know how much danger you're putting yourself in. And sometimes it's best to trust your gut, because it could just save your life. Number 8. Ghost Girl Submitted by Alex I grew up in Merrillville in a small apartment, and I spent a bit of my free time browsing Tinder, but not really matching with anyone. I was on Tinder one night, scrolling through, and I saw a girl named Mary Jane. I'd always loved that name, and she was really cute. We had actually matched, so I messaged her immediately, and she texted back. We talked for a couple of hours, and for that time, it was pretty fun. But then it all went downhill when she started talking about how she had died. What? Was she on something? I thought. Then she said, you're just like the others. You don't believe. You just think I'm crazy. Well, I'll show you. She stopped sending messages after that, and I was kind of thankful. She was obviously messed up in the head. I tried to get some sleep that night, but I had trouble falling asleep, especially after being so creeped out by that strange girl. When I did finally drift off, I was soon awakened by the feeling of weight pressing down on my bed, like someone had just sat down. When I looked up, I saw her looking back at me. I nearly screamed and I crawled back away from her, and as I did, she smiled and then faded into nothingness. After that, I could not find her profile on Tinder again. It was as if she never existed and I hoped it was all just some bizarre and vivid dream. Ever since then, I haven't been back on Tinder. Number 9. Creepy Vibes, submitted by Alexis. I regret meeting a certain creep after dumping my long-term boyfriend. That relationship was dry. I wanted a physical one, but my ex wouldn't put out. So after breaking up, I just hooked up with whoever I could find. I was starved, so at that point I didn't care who came to my bed. Now is when the creep enters the story. I remember his bio pretty well. He had a very strange name. His bio said he had six dogs and one of his photos was of him and his pit bull. He didn't look half bad and being a sucker for cute dogs, I swiped right. We matched, and we didn't really talk at first. One night, I was having one of my urges, and I hit him up. He was more than pleased to come over. He didn't give any immediate signs of danger. When he showed up, he brought some Red's hard cider. We went to my dorm, and we tried talking. He kept giving me these vibes. I ignored it, and of course, we did the deed. He asked me to be his girlfriend, but I said no. I just wanted him out as soon as possible. Months go by and I stop texting him, but he keeps messaging me. One day I get the nerve to text back and I pretty much tell him, I'm in a dedicated relationship with a girl. I thought I was bi, but it turns out I'm lesbian. Sorry. He tried to hardcore guilt me into cheating on my made up girlfriend. Then he left me alone. Now, fast forward a few months, and I'm eating lunch with my friend Paige. 
She was on Facebook and we got to talking about her creepy step cousin. She showed me a picture and my heart sank. It was the same guy I met from Tinder. Here's the kicker. He had attempted to take his own life when he was 14. He was also emotionally abusive towards some of his exes and he had stolen money from Paige's stepdad. To make matters worse, he would always brag about how he nearly took someone's life and was only sentenced to a few months because he was just a minor. He was so proud of that, acting like he wanted to do it again. And he was a hard drug user, though he had a wife the entire time. I must have been pale as a ghost, because Paige asked, is everything okay? I told her, I think I had met up with your cousin from Tinder. She replied with, oh lord, and I nodded. We did it. That's when she started freaking out on me. We sat there shook trying to comprehend what happened, and I was so embarrassed. Now those weird vibes telling me to stay away made sense. I stayed on Tinder for a while, but I'm off now due to other bizarre incidents. If you're looking into dating on an online app, you should probably expect to be a little creeped out here and there. And number 10. Something's not right with Tinder. Submitted by Thin Air. This happened when I was 13 and I lived in Topeka, Kansas. When I got Tinder, I wasn't expecting much. Probably just some creeps and maybe some people that I would get matched with. People my age, of course. My friend, let's call him Jimmy, tried the app out himself and said he loved it so I decided to give it a try myself. When I first logged in, I was super excited. I got matched with people I didn't know, but that didn't bother me. I thought it was just cool to get matched with someone you don't know, so that way you can probably get to know them better. Although one of the people I chatted with had an awfully weird name. All their name was was a bunch of ones and zeros, I immediately found that odd, but I let it be. The guy probably didn't know a name he could use, or he was trying to be funny. He ended up being the person that always texted me, day and night, never really leaving me alone. The guy didn't talk about himself much, and always seemed to want to know things about me, like where I lived and all of that, but I usually just ignored it. Later on, I was getting messages by this person day and night, and they would not leave me alone. I eventually stopped using Tinder and blocked all the notifications from it. When I looked up his name once, I never saw anything. User doesn't exist, the app would read. It was really freaky. Yes, I did reinstall the app to try to get some answers. I went back into the chats we had had, and I messaged him. Hey, a uh, weird question, but why does the app say your account doesn't exist? But there was no response. I figured the guy was hacking or something, or there was something about the software that I was missing. But after getting no response, I just deleted the app again. Maybe I was overthinking it. Maybe I wasn't. One day at home, I was looking for something in my room. It was an old 1980s figure or something like that. I knew it had to be in my room, but where exactly? My parents couldn't have used it or found it. They usually leave my stuff alone and my parents have no use for toys. Besides that, they were on a weekend vacation in Hawaii. Suddenly, and no joke, the figure dropped onto my head. I remember thinking, ow, what the heck? I looked straight up, but I saw nothing. My phone rang right after that. It was a message from the user on Tinder. I was shocked. I thought I'd deleted that app once and for all, but there it was. The message read simply, did you find it? I screamed and dropped my phone immediately. I ran out of my room after that, shutting the doors behind me. Nothing else bizarre happened like that. And again, I haven't been touching my Tinder app. You know, the one that wasn't even on my phone. And I haven't even tried any other matching apps like it. 
Whatever was going on, it wasn't normal. But for a long while there, whatever it was, I thought it had left me alone. Until I received a text message straight to my number, an all too familiar image. It was binary, ones and zeros. Being creeped out again, I took the moment to look it up online with a binary code translator, and what it ended up saying chilled me. I'm always watching. No matter how you do this dating thing, you're always going out on a limb when you meet new people, and especially when you're using an app or an online dating service. Because online dating adds a layer of anonymity where anyone can become anyone. Heck, even I could go online right now and make my profile look like I'm a 13-year-old girl. Imagine all the wrong types of attention I'd be getting, and imagine all the people who are doing that right now, preying upon you, preying upon your children. So as with anything, take it with caution, and listen to your instincts, because that might be the only thing keeping you from a cold and quiet death. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Oh, and here are my five favorite early comments from my previous video on 10 Eastern European ghost stories. Abe Reyes says, I'm proud of you. This one makes me happy because they're proud of me, and it also confuses me because I don't know what they're proud about. But thank you, Abe. Mr. Sandwich says, Oh, hey, this is it before the night of a storm. This will keep me busy while I draw. Thank you, I love your videos. Mr. Sandwich, if you're still out there and the storm didn't get you, please respond. Bloody Rabbit says, I just woke from a nap. Best day ever. I love your work. The best day ever for me would be when I don't wake up from the nap. Just kidding, I love life. And my wife would kill me if I died. Gaming with Finn says, I missed again, if only. Yes, if only one day you were one of the comments that I read and replied to. One day. And a lead lion cat, not the amateur one, says, Oh God, what is that? That, my friend, in the thumbnail is a Drekovic, and it wants to eat your soul. And don't forget to send me your Starbucks stories with the links in the description. Also, if you wanted to do something extra to support this channel, you could always go to my Patreon at patreon.com slash darknessprevails and pledge just one buck a month. The more people who donate, the closer we get to not having to depend on YouTube, because at the moment, if YouTube crashed and burned, I'm not sure if I could keep this channel going. Or you could go to morbidmonsters.com, because there I've got stickers, decals for your vehicles, coffee mugs, and t-shirts displaying your favorite monsters. Anyway, to everyone who has supported that little extra, and to anyone still listening, thank you. Stay safe out there, and stay creepy.